Okay, welcome to our uh, Bible study as we go through the book of Proverbs. Uh, we are about halfway through the book of Proverbs. We'll try and finish uh, chapter 16 this evening. And we've titled this evening's lesson, A Righteous Rule. <clears throat> Last week we broached the topic of righteous rule. Uh, that is, leaders who rule righteously. Uh, we didn't get far in this topic, so I want to uh, spend some time uh, finishing the topic. And I want to do a little bit of review from uh, last week's lesson. The Bible commands those who are in authority over us to rule righteously. What does that mean to rule righteously? That means uh, if you're in a leadership position, you have to do what is right by God, what is right by your people, and what is right by, the, the, by your integrity and by the ethics you're bound to uphold. Uh, today we have uh, certain leaders, we call them politicians, who are in high positions ruling over our country. But I can say these people are a vexation to the righteous. I was reading uh, some time today regarding New York City and the wealthy people are fleeing the city, the city of New York, the actual city of New York. And the mayor is actually pleading for them to come back. And uh, they are seeing a shortfall in their budget. And guess what their solution is? Not to change their policy, but to actually increase people's taxes. Now, if you do that, you're going to lose more rich people. Uh, you've got to keep in mind, people hate the rich people, but who are the ones that pay the taxes? The poor people don't pay the taxes. Uh, the people that make the income, with the high incomes, they're the ones that are paying the taxes. Uh, so when I hear these things and I see these, uh, these leaders and, and no, not knowing what they're doing, I, I can tell you, I almost become unglued of what's going on in our nation today. And I shouldn't, I should compose myself, because I'm having a hard time. Uh, you have uh, people being elected uh, over, and every time uh, the elections come around, they keep promising the same thing. But when they get into power, nothing changes. And yet the people vote for them time in and time again. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. And then some people get to the point where they say, well, I'm going to quit voting because uh, nothing will change. And that's, to some extent, that's true. They, uh, today we have in our nation one law for the uh, elite and another for the common folk. And that's not, that's not righteous rule. The Bible condemns that. You have these people, they bring up false accusations against certain people and they destroy their lives. Uh, but they, when they're found out that they have lied to the government or lied to uh, uh, law enforcement officials, what happens to them? They go scot-free. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, verse 2, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. And that's where we're at right now. We have a lot of wicked people in high positions and the American people are mourning. I, for one, am mourning. And I'm praying for righteous leadership. And that's what, as Christians, we have to pray. The Bible commands us, uh, if you say, oh, we shouldn't get involved in politics, then why did God, in Romans chapter 13, command us to pray for those who are in authority over us? Why did God command us to pray for the peace of our, the place that we live in? The Bible says, in the peace of the city that you live in, uh, you will enjoy the peace. Pray for the peace of the city that you are living. And... Uh, as we're going to look at some verses in the book of Proverbs, this theme that we, uh, we introduced in our lesson this evening will be continued. Uh, Revel Proverbs chapter 16. I'm going to read a few verses up to verse 20. I want to begin in verse 12. If you have your Bibles, turn to uh, chapter 16, verse 12. It is an abomination to kings to commit wickedness, for the throne is established by righteousness. Righteous lips are the delight of kings, and they that love him... That speak, and they love him that speaketh right. The wrath of, the, of a king is as messengers of death, but a wise man will pacify it. And the light of the king's countenance is life, and his favor is as a cloud of the latter rain. Much, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold, and to get understanding rather than to be chosen, uh, and understanding rather to be chosen than silver. The highway of the upright is to depart from him evil. Uh, he that keepeth his way preserveth his soul. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before fall. Very important verse here, chapter 16, verse 18. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with a lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good, and whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. A lot of good verses we're going to look at this evening, and let's begin uh, by looking at verse number 12. 
It is an abomination to kings to commit wickedness, for the throne is established by righteousness. <clears throat> we did deal with this uh, topic a little bit in Lesson 25, uh, when we looked at Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. Let me read Proverbs 14, 34 for you. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. When uh, our leaders are ruling in righteousness, the people rejoice. You look at this uh, defund the police movement. Uh, what happens when you remove law enforcement from society? You have lawlessness. And then you see the majority of the American people are against this. Why would they want to remove uh, law enforcement? The, you know law enforcement is ordained by God. Read Romans chapter 13. If you're in law enforcement, you're in a position that is ordained by God. You're in essence a minister of God if you study uh, Romans chapter 13. But God hates, uh, the, the, God hates it when those in power commit wickedness. He says... It is an abomination to him. What is an abomination? An abomination is extreme hatred for something. Uh, God hates when rulers rule unrighteously. Uh, and, and I myself, I have to be honest with you, uh, I hate the reality that we have politicians who do not fear God. Uh, politicians who have no moral compass, who are selling us out for the measly dollar. Right. They are bought and paid for. And you know what? I can't wait for Christ to come back according to the book of Isaiah. We, in our Bible reading, we're, we're going through the book of Isaiah. Um, hopefully you have maintained your Bible reading as when we started our 2020 challenge in the beginning of the year. If you, go, if you go to our website, uh, eobcfl.org, you'll see every day we post the Bible reading for the day. And you can follow along with us. You should be in the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah's theme is the coming, the second coming of Christ. That's the theme of the book. The majority of the book deals with that event in history. And only when Christ comes will we have true justice and peace in the world. Only when the peace, the Prince of Peace comes, will it be peace and righteousness. In Revelation chapter 2, 27, the Bible says, And he, this is Christ, shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. When Christ comes back, he's not going to play games. Either you obey or you will be uh, punished. Isaiah chapter 61, 11 says, For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as a garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. I can't wait for that day. Uh, no ruler has rule. Uh, no ruler can rule unless he rules in righteousness. Uh, the only king that we can say came close to, to this admonition from the book of Proverbs is uh, King David. Uh, if you look at the life of King David, there was only uh, one matter which he really uh, disobeyed against God, and uh, that brought upon him the chastening of the Lord. But when Christ comes back, he will truly establish the throne with righteousness. Uh, verse 13, Righteous lips are the delight of kings, and they that love him, and they love him that speaketh right. I'm going to try to bring this verse closer to home. When you see certain politicians speak of righteousness, what does that do to you? I, I cheer them on. I'm like, go for it. Uh, one of these politicians that I delight in every time he speaks is uh, Jim Jordan. Yes. And I'm, I, he's in Ohio, so I'm not endorsing him. We're in Florida. Uh, so I, but I, I just say that I like this guy. Uh, every time he talks, he speaks righteousness. Uh, I would love to see this man be president one day. Uh, when you see someone speak the truth yeah. with conviction, what does that do for you? You say, Amen. Uh, preach it, brother, or preach it, sister. And now, I'm not, con I'm not endorsing uh, female uh, pastors <laughs> and teachers. Don't get me wrong. But, but when it comes to preaching the gospel, we all have to preach the gospel. Men, women, and children. And we have a woman say amen because she <laughs> understands where I'm coming from. Uh, so we have to be careful with that. But, but uh, the Bible has reserved the pastor of, uh, uh, the pastor of position. The position of pastor, I'll, I'll get it right. Sometimes I mix my sentences up. And the uh, position of a deacon for men. Now it doesn't mean that women cannot be involved in church. Uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, 
Everyone should be involved in church, but those positions have been reserved to men, and God, God set it out that way. Um, if you remember Phoebe, she was a servant, a very important servant, uh, to the point that Paul says, obey her, listen to her, a very important figure in the church. Now, a lot of people uh, make her out to be a deaconess. That's not in the Bible. No, it's in the modern versions, but I will uh, <laughs> go to verse 14 because I'm going to chase a squirrel that I don't want to get lost in a, in a tree. Uh, verse 14. <clears throat> the wrath of a king is his messengers of death, but a wise man will pacify it. What does this mean? That means that when a king gets angry and he's about to punish you, uh, you have to uh, use your wit and speak quickly to try to... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for when you extinguish a uh, firecracker? What was that? The fuse. I like that word. What was that... Uh, well, what did you use? What did you say? No. It could be a good word. Okay. So Evelyn does not want to be put on the spot, so we will pass. I like the word diffuse. Uh, you can diffuse the situation. You've heard uh, um, someone come to you and say, I am the law. Usually in Hollywood movies, you have the sheriff and he says, I am the law. Uh, but uh, when you see a man approach you that way, you have to be very careful. There's Luke giving me a smile. Um, I get distracted as, as I get older. Great things to look forward to. Things to look forward to, yes, Ms. Nicole. It depends on your mind how it's all structured. I'm already distracted. You're already distracted. <laughs> uh, you got a world of hurt ahead of you. Yep. <laughs> so, I like my notes because uh, when I get distracted, I just look down and say, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be in my notes. Uh, so, remember the uh, story of the woman, the wise woman of Tekoa. When uh, Absalom wanted to go see his dad, David d didn't have, wanted nothing to do with his son Absalom because he killed uh, his other son Amnon. But uh, uh, Absalom wanted, really to, wanted so bad to see his dad. So he set up Joab and he says, can I go see my dad? Can you talk to my dad for me? Remember, Joab was the uh, cousin of David. He was David's cousin. And he was also the general of David's army. Uh, so one day Absalom uh, is waiting for Joab to talk to David on his behalf, but it doesn't happen. So what Absalom does is he sets Joab's field on fire, and Joab says to him, why did you set my field on fire? He says, I've been asking you all this time to go speak to my dad on my behalf. So Joab says, I'll do it. So he sets up the woman of Tekoa, and she talks to David. And she was a wise woman, the Bible says. Uh, so she pacified the king's wrath through her wisdom. Again, uh, this verse here, the wrath of the king is as messengers of death, but a wise man will pacify it. You can take this verse and uh, spiritually apply it to the Christian. A, a Christian is a wise man in that he, now again, when I use the male term, I'm, I'm speaking on, the, uh, on mankind. Uh, people have lost the meaning of the, the understanding of the English language. So they think when you talk about he and man, they get offended. When mankind is, is, is a male noun. So when you say he, you're referring to mankind. You're not, being, you're, not, you're not trying to misrepresent women. So when I say a Christian man is wise, I'm referring to men, women, and children who are born-again Christians. They are wise in the sense that they have trusted Christ to appease the wrath, to pacify the wrath of the king. John 3.36 says this, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but, see that? But the wrath of God abideth on him. Every single lost person today is walking around with a cloud over their head. And that cloud is the wrath of God. And the wrath of God will be manifest either in hell or the lake of fire if they refuse to receive Christ as their Savior. So what did I do? What did you do if you are a Christian here uh, listening to my voice? The moment you received Christ as Savior, what did you do? You pacified the wrath. Of the king. A very beautiful uh, spiritual application for this verse. So the next verse we're going to look at is uh, verse 15. Is it 15? Yes. In the light, verse 15, in the light of a king's countenance is life, and his favor is as a cloud of the latter rain. Again, this uh, verse has a similar theme to the previous verse, but it's the opposite though. It's not having a king be angry at you, but having a king 
have favor toward you. The light of, king, of a king's countenance is the face of the king. If the king looks at you with favor, then you have nothing to worry about. If you go before the king, remember Esther, uh, in, the, in the book of Esther, she wanted to approach the king, but it was in the day that if the king did not uh, reach out his scepter toward you when you approached him, that you would be put to death by his guards. So she said, pray, and they fasted and they prayed so that she may receive favor of the king. If you receive favor from the king, uh, you will be spared. And his favor is, the, is as a cloud of the latter rain. Uh, what is the latter rain? The latter eight rain is the last bit of rain required for to get that that harvest to the point where it's ripe enough to uh, to pick. And that's the latter rain. Spiritually speaking, if today if you gain the favor of the king, what happens to you? How do you gain the favor of the king? You receive eternal life. Uh, you gain the favor of God. How? By receiving his son as your savior. Uh, a lot of Christians try to uh, uh, please God. You, by living right, yes, you do please God, but there's nothing more you need to do than accept His Son as your Savior to be accepted in the Beloved. A lot of Christians, they try to uh, uh, appease God in a way by, by struggling and striving to live right. Uh, you, you don't have to do anything to receive God's favor, but to receive His Son. Now, uh, let's, that's salvation, and then after salvation, you do have to live. And I liked it how one pastor one time explained it. Uh, living a life pleasing to God is basically a thank you letter to God for saving your soul. Mm -hmm. Nothing more and nothing less. Now, I'm not better than you or you're not better than me. Uh, we're all one in Christ. and We all have received the favor of God by receiving His Son. But we have to live righteously. As, as the, the more righteous you live, the more you're telling God that I really appreciate what you did for me. And that's why holiness is so important. And uh, that's why many times I, I try to be careful when I preach on holiness and preach on holy living and preach on righteous living that you don't mistake me as being a legalist. Uh, we're not legalist. Uh, I, I don't, I can't, I'm a firm believer as, is that I teach the Bible, but the Holy Spirit takes that and convicts you as what you should do. Yes, we have standards, but I have to be careful that I don't make these standards a legal requirement. It's a fine line we have to walk. Uh, I want to be holy. I want to live righteously because I want to uh, please my Father in the way that I'm, I want to say, God, I'm so thankful that you saved my soul. Therefore, I will do what I can to live the life that you expect me to live. Verse 16. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather than choice silver? We've comment, commented on this uh, verse. Uh, well, not this verse per se, but the theme that behind this verse, the thought behind this verse. In Lesson 5, in Proverbs, when we looked at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 14, and also looked at Lesson 12. Uh, I don't want to get to the point where I'm repeating a lot of the lessons because we're going to be studying the book of Proverbs for the next uh, 20 years, and I don't want to do that. I remember one time a preacher was saying, he preached on, uh, I forget what book he preached on, and he preached on it for decades, and he was, uh, literally, he preached on a book, on a particular book for decades, and he was proud of that fact. And I'm like, okay, I'm glad you were able to do that, but you're doing your people a disservice, because mm -hmm. uh, you have to teach the whole Bible, not just one book. So we're going to move on, but I do want to show you how, uh, how closely this verse is to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 14. For the merchandise of it is, uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 14 is speaking of wisdom. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. It's uh, sad how many people have sold out, uh, have missed out on the blessings of God in pursuit of the mighty dollar. My son and I were uh, having, my son and I were having a discussion a few days ago. Uh, he said, well, uh, it's usually the almighty dollar. I said, I don't like saying the almighty dollar because I'm, I'm ascribing greatness to the dollar that only belongs to God. So I like to say the mighty dollar. Uh, the next verse, verse 17, is pretty self-explanatory. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He that keepeth his way preserveth his soul. 
we looked at uh, this topic in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7. Uh, you can look at that in lesson 4. And again, in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6. Uh, I think we did that in last week's lesson. So we looked at that in last week's lesson. But I do want to read Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7. Be not, in, be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. There is wisdom to those who depart from evil. What is a verse in the New Testament that may come to mind? What does the Bible tell us? Flee what? All appearance of evil. Uh, many times you see the Old Testament law, and, and Jesus Christ in the New Testament takes it one step further. He doesn't want us to just flee evil. He wants us to flee all appearance of evil. It may not be evil in itself, but if it looks evil, run away from it. Flee. It was a preacher, he preached a message. I think it was a five, the five fleas in the Bible. It's uh, funny because you think when you think of the five fleas, you think of, okay, how many fleas does my dog have or my cat? But he was talking about things that you need to run away from. Uh, let's look at uh, verse 18. And I like this verse, a verse that every, uh, every Christian should take to heart. A pride goeth before destruction and the haughty spirit before a fall. The proud, the arrogant, the conceited, those who are, uh, I don't know if this is proper English or if people get offended. When I was growing up and even at work, we talked about those who are full of themselves. Is that a, is that a proper term to use? Mm -hmm. uh, they will fall one day. Be rest assured, the Bible says they will fall. Every once in a while I go on YouTube and my kids like, I don't know if my kids ever watch these videos, uh, instant karma videos. Have you ever watched those? I love watching those videos because it brings this verse to fruition. You see the people that are so arrogant and all of a sudden they just mess things up and you just laugh and you say, oh, he deserved it or she deserved it. Anyways, I gotta, go, gotta move on, but uh, it makes brings a smile to my face. I don't know if that's my twisted sense of humor, but uh, well, it's our, it's our sinful nature, yes. <laughs> But isn't, when you see someone who's proud and they get, a, they get a taste of their own medicine, doesn't it make you feel good? It, it, and I'm not saying this is right. We no, should. there's a proverb that says not to do that. Yes, that's right. <laughs> you shouldn't rejoice when people fall. But in a twisted way, you get some kind of uh, vindication. Vindic enjoyment out of it, vindication. Uh, he deserved what was coming to him. Uh, but the Bible says this, pride goeth before destruction. And the Holy Spirit before a fall. There was a video I was watching of protesters protesting, and there was this, uh, and they were protesting, and this guy got really upset. But those guys were Christians, and they were just preaching the gospel on the street. And uh, they, these people were anti-protesters. I think they were Antifa or BLM. I forget what it was, but those two Christians were ex-Marines. So one guy was getting ready to punch the other guy, and the guy saw him. And he grabbed his fist in midair. He, he picked on the wrong people. Mm -hmm. I just felt good. But anyways. Um, I want to give you a few verses where the Bible teaches the thing. Uh, teaches that God hates pride. And as a Christian, you have to examine yourself. Make sure you're not walking in the spirit of pride, but in the spirit of meekness. James chapter 4, verse 6 says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And Peter 5, 5 says, 1 uh, Peter 5, 5 says along the same thing. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Uh, James, the Bible says, uh, James himself says, For wherefore he saith, so James and Peter are both quoting Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. But if you uh, look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, it doesn't, it doesn't match exactly to what Peter and James are quoting. Let me read to you Proverbs 3, 34. Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. So what is the Spirit doing, the Holy Spirit doing to us? He is telling us that the scorner is a proud person. Because James is telling us, uh, we know James is quoting from the Old Testament. Because if you look at the second half of uh, James chapter 4, verse 6, but giveth grace unto the humble. 
Proverbs 3.34, the second half of that verse says, But he giveth grace unto the lowly. The lowly and the humble are one and the same. Um, if you look at, uh, I've got the Greek Bible. When I was little, my I had no idea there was such thing as an English Bible. I would read the Greek Bible, and I was curious to see how it translated the Hebrew. And I looked it up, and the Greek Bible that I used when I was a kid, uh, it's like the King James Version of the Greek in the, in the Greek language. It says, surely he resists the proud. But the Hebrew word clearly means scorner instead of proud. So I believe the Holy Spirit is trying to make the connection that the, uh, the scorner is a proud person. Who remembers what a scorner is from our previous studies? Anyone? What is a scorner? I think it's somebody who thinks they know everything. Yes, someone who thinks, who thinks they know everything and who doesn't want to be corrected. Uh, uh, you're not going to tell me what to do. That's a scorner. If you look at the English definition of a scorner. And the, what the Bible is telling us, so they see a sense of sibling rivalry going on over here. <laughs> the Bible tells us that a scorner is a proud person. So a proud person is someone who says, you're not going to tell me what to do. A uh, scorner thinks they're always right. A proud person thinks uh, they're always right. Henry Cloud said, pride asks who's right. Humility asks what's right. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard Baxter said, I think so far as any man is proud, he is kin to the devil and utterly a stranger to God and to himself. That's right. The Bible, that's right. This man must have read uh, Job 41, verse 43. Listen to what Job says in verse uh, 34 of chapter 41. Uh, and this chapter is referring to the devil, Leviathan. <laughs> Henry Cloud. Now, sometimes when I quote some of these people, uh, I quote the, some of the good things. I don't necessarily agree with their philosophy or theology. But if someone says something something right, he says something right. You can't take that away from them. Uh, he's, let me re repeat that. Henry Cloud, there was a question on that. He said, pride asks, who's right? Humility asks, what's right? And that's what a humble person is. Um, and I want to just pause there for a minute. So one of the uh, things that keep people from getting saved is pride. Because pride says, uh, I can do it myself. I don't need, I'm not a sinner. I don't need no savior. Whereas humility says, uh, yes, I am a sinner and I need someone to save me. Did I say something backwards? Or? Maybe that I don't need no savior. I don't need no savior. That's, That's right. Funny. That's a double negative. That's a double negative. <laughs> so, being Greek, we speak this way because uh, the double negative is in the Greek language. And I see my Nina is, 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 is a green double thumbs up. Because... <laughs> Because she's Greek, and uh, you speak that way in the Greek language, the double negatives. So sometimes it carries on into your, into your, um, into your English, into English. It sounds you, funny though. It sounds funny, but you you talk that way sometimes. Uh, when I was uh, when I was in school, I would write an essay and say, "Well, my mother told me to pick up my room," and the teacher marked an X on it. And she goes, "Why did you mark an X on it?" She goes, "What does that mean? How can you pick up your room?" Well, I was translating it from my mom was telling me because mm -hmm. in Greek, when you say pick up your room, it means clean your room. Yeah. So the word used in Greek to clean your room is the same. If you translate it, it translates to pick up your room. Mm -hmm. So you can see how you, uh, anyways, you butcher the English language because of your native tongue. But that's okay. But what I wanted to read is, uh, uh, yes, uh, the Greek words have uh, many different meanings makes the job of translation difficult many times. Mm -hmm. But I want to read Job chapter 41, verse 34. When Job talks about mm -hmm. Leviathan and Behemoth, when God talks about Leviathan and Behemoth in the book of Job, he's basically talking about the devil. And in verse 34, he says, He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. The devil is their king. I find it ironic that the word, the the alphabet soup lifestyle used to describe their movement is the word pride. Mm -hmm. You think that's ironic? You think that's a coincidence? I don't think it's a coincidence. They call themselves a proud, pride, pride march. What, are, what they are telling us, spiritually speaking, by using that word, they're telling us that their father is the devil. And they don't even know it. 
Uh, that was free, by the way. If you want, you can send your check in the mail. Uh, but pride can also enter into the heart of a Christian. Those who think themselves to be better than others, uh, I believe, are ready to fall under the judgment of God. The Bible cautions us. Look what Galatians 6 1 says Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. But what do we do as Christians when we see a brother being taken over in a fault? We kick him. That's right. <laughs> Well, uh, my, my in-laws would say, uh, Nicole said, you kick him. At the same time, I said, you kick him. Uh, my in-laws would say, great minds think alike, but small minds never differ. Mm -hmm. so, but that's true, we kick him. Man. That's, that's a sad testimony mm -hmm. of cr Christians. When we see a brother who is struggling with a particular sin, instead of helping them in the spirit of meekness, we've got to be careful that we don't also get tempted with the same th sin that they're in, you have to be careful that you don't criticize someone for committing a particular sin that you yourself do not fall into the same sin that you're condemning your brother or sister that being involved in. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to help them in the spirit of meekness. Mm -hmm. But to be meek doesn't mean to be weak. But when you are meek, you're strong in the faith and you have completely surrendered to the Holy Spirit. What was said of Moses, the meekest man on the face of the earth? Yeah. Christ himself was called lowly and meek. Um, when you see the weak brother, never think, and never think, I don't do what he does, therefore I am better than him. I don't read the same Bible version that he or she does. I don't listen to the same music they, they, that they do. I don't hang out with the same people that they do. Uh, you have to restore them in a spirit of meekness. And that's why sometimes uh, you, have to be, you can't be belligerent. When someone disagrees with you in a certain doctrinal position, you have to be able to teach them your position. Not just blast them for not believing the same way you do. Because right. perhaps maybe you're the one that's in, in the error and that's not right. they. Um, that's right. Verse 19. Can I say something? Yes, Miss Nicole, go ahead. That verse is a really good test of your spiritual condition because it says ye which are spiritual. So if you are doing those things, you know, criticizing and kicking, mm -hmm. you're not you spiritual. are not spiritual. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you need to grow. So, Miss Nicole made the comment that this verse is also a, an indicator of your spiritual condition. Because it says, ye which are spiritual. So, if you are kicking the brother who is down, you're demonstrating your lack of spirituality. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Uh, because if you're spiritual, then you're going to help the brother. You're going to bring up the brother in a spirit of meekness. That's a good point. Uh, I love that verse, Galatians chapter 6, mm -hmm. verse 1. If only many Christians would take that to heart. Because yeah. when you look at the brother or sister... You're not going to look at them as someone who is below you or beneath you, but you can look at some of them, perhaps maybe God would put it upon uh, your heart to help them. Uh, or allow, uh, allow you to enter their life so that you can be a help to them. Verse 19, Better it is to be of a humble spirit with a lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. This is a great verse too, uh, because it makes you choose the path of life. Uh, many times you see people want to make money, they, they have a financial deal, but they're going to go about it by crooked means to obtain this profit or obtain this deal. Uh, and they are proud, the Bible says. You're better off avoiding those people and miss out on this financial deal, but to be humble and to hang out with the lowly. Um, a humble life among the lowly is better than gaining riches if it means I would have to give up my uh, integrity and hang among the proud so I can get money. How many Christians have ruined the testimony because they've compromised their integrity, uh, because they've hung around with the wrong people just to make the extra dollar? And I think many times what was happening to us and what's happening in our society today, I believe we we're going to be forced as Christians sooner or later to choose between good and evil. Are we going to stand up for the good? There was a couple of doctors a few weeks ago who stood up for uh, their convictions as medical professionals, trying to tell the American public how... Uh, you don't have to die from COVID. There's medications that can help you. And it's sad to learn that one of those doctors was fired. Is that, is, where's, where's integrity in, in the medical establishment? I felt sorry for this doctor. I pray she wins her lawsuit. Uh, she's suing the hospital. Good for her. Um, she, I hope she gets herself a good lawyer. But she's continuing speaking out against what her experience was. 
Mm -hmm. It's a shame that uh, our society has, has come to that today. Yeah. So look at let's look at verse uh, next verse. I, I lose track sometimes. Where are we at now? Verse eighteen. Verse nineteen of Proverbs chapter sixteen. We're at twenty. Okay, thank you. He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good, and whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. Um, I've heard when I was younger a preacher preach uh, decades ago, and he said, uh, "There's two things a Christian must learn, and if a Christian does these two things, they will avoid many problems in their life: trust and obey. Uh, you got to learn to trust God." And you've got to learn to obey God. Um, and uh, the hymn writer says, For there is no other way. Obedience to God uh, is a non-negotiable with God. When I talk to my children sometimes, I tell them, uh, Obedience is non-negotiable. I expect you to obey. Mm -hmm. And if you don't obey, there's consequences. It's non-negotiable. When you do not trust in God, you're in essence attacking His character. Mm -hmm. You're basically telling God, You cannot do this, God. When you don't trust in God. And when you don't obey, you're basically disobeying Him. Uh, I like this quote. I use it often. Man says, show me and I'll trust you. God says, trust me and I will show you. Uh, lately, I've been seeing some videos popping up on YouTube about Christians who, uh, they call it deconversion. They're leaving the faith. Uh, pastors, uh, people, youth leaders, people that... Uh, they, they admit that at one point in their life they were born again Christians, but they no longer, they no longer believe in the Bible, and they no longer believe in God. And you should see, you should watch their testimony on, on YouTube. And I was like, the Bible is so right. Mm -hmm. Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. In the last days some that speaketh, the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter days some shall what? Depart from, Depart from the faith. And that's actually, they're literally departing from the faith. And they claim that, yes, when I was 11, when I was 18, when I was this, I, I, I became a born-again Christian. I started reading and praying and attending church. But they're now leaving. It's, they're calling it deconversion. But what it is, I think what it is, is they're falling prey to the seducing spirits and doctrines of devil that the Bible tells us that, they, that would happen in the last days. Uh, trust and obey God. Uh, You've got to trust and obey God. Both of these things are learned behaviors. Yeah. Even the Bible says Christ, that Christ learned obedience in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, and Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Laban says, I learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. Um, I don't know why Christians have a hard time trusting and obeying God. I, I don't understand it. Uh, I don't understand it. Uh, yes, you'll fall. We're not perfect. But why is it so hard for you to trust in someone who saved your soul? Why is it so hard to obey someone who has your best interests in mind? Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand it. I want to read you something that Spurgeon wrote regarding this matter. He said this, I have read a story of an old doctor of the church who going out one morning met a beggar and said to him, I wish you a good day, sir, said he. I never had an ill day in my life, replied the beggar. But, said the doctor, your clothes are torn to rags and your wallet seems to be exceedingly empty, said he. Then the beggar says, my clothes are as good as God wills them to be, and my wallet is as full as the Lord has been pleased to make it. And what pleases him pleases me. But, said the doctor, suppose God should cast you into hell. Indeed, sir, said he. But that would never be. But if it were, I would be count. I would be contended, for I have two long and strong arms, faith and love, and I would throw these about the neck of my Savior, and I would never let him go, so that if I went there, he would be with me, and it would be a heaven to me. Oh, those two strong arms of faith and love! If you can but hang about the Savior's neck, Savior's neck, indeed, you may fear no ill weather. Uh, when you trust in the Lord, you will never be disappointed. This man, basically, it's a, it's a, it's a non-starter. We were teaching our kids about non-starters. Uh, 
Suppose this happens. Well, I told my children, this hypothetical situation you're bringing up is a non-starter. And this man talking about ending up in hell is a non-starter for the Christian. But he said, if it were be, if it would be the case, then my Savior would be with me. Uh, so again, this is just a simple illustration. We know that uh, it, doctrinally it does not match up with what the New Testament says. But that means that if you trust God, He will always be there with you. No matter where you are, He will always be there with you. Um, the next few verses I'm going to look at. Oh, it's past 8 o'clock already. I was hoping to get to the next chapter. Do we, uh, do we go on or do we just pause here and continue on next week? Will we have enough time to finish it all? I don't think we'll have enough time to finish the whole. We just start next week. Uh, I've got too much here going. So you know what I'll do? Uh, let's take a few minutes. If you have any questions or comments, uh, we'll take a few minutes. I'll take some questions or some comments. And if not, uh, we will uh, continue on next week because it's past 8 o'clock. Even if uh, those uh, who are uh, logged in, if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to uh, post them. And if not, we'll continue on next week. And if we can't answer your questions, we will uh, handle them next week. Okay? Because I'd like to start finishing on time. <laughs> Some people are uh, smiling in agreement. It's because an eight-month-old requires it. Okay, so uh, we'll... Uh, <laughs> I will uh, pa I will stop here, and I will continue with chapter. I'll finish chapter sixteen next week. We're glad to see you guys next week, and glad you guys logged in. Uh, we'll see you next week, same time, same place.